getting fixed up when you wake up you're pretty enough look at your window at the cloud of dust that's my headlights that's my truck come on baby don't you keep me waiting i gotta go i got a reservation tailgate for two underneath the stars kiss on your lips when you're in This is Professor Klein bringing to the, you the knee and the leg PowerPoint. And like that video intro was saying, running out of moonlight, we are running out of anatomy topics to cover because we are in the knee and the leg or almost to the foot, which is the last part of the human body that we will discuss. And lots to talk about with the knee and the leg and to build off the hip and the pelvis region. So remember everything from those past couple PowerPoints and we'll tie it together because these things are linked together and they affect one and another. But as always, review of the bones, the bony landmarks of a region. We will be working down in this region here, but you wanna know everything up top as well. Looking down here, we just review the tibia which contacts at the knee joint with the fibula on the lateral side, but also notice the ankle and the foot with the tarsus, metatarsus, and phalanges as well. well. Let's dive into the knee. And with the knee, this is a posterior view of the knee. And this is a great picture to show you. There is a lot going on in the knee. There are muscles coming down from the hip such as your hamstring, such as your quadriceps, your adductors, your IT band, everything's coming down. And a lot of them will cross the knee joint. This is like the line for the knee joint here. A lot of them will cross the knee joint and attach or insert below the knee. But you've got a lot of muscles coming up from the leg, like your calf muscles that cross the knee joint. So there's a lot of overlap at the knee. Why? Well, the knee itself, just like the elbow, can be very unstable, but it's got a lot of muscles to protect it from doing the wrong motions. Also a reminder here, the sciatic nerve, remember that largest nerve in the back of the leg is coming down, it turns into tibial, and it travels all the way down the knee. It does split here at the common fibular, which goes more anterior and lateral at the side, but we've got a lot of nerves, artery and vein traveling down, and again, when it's in the back of the knee, it's the popliteal artery and vein, super deep. Now, the knee itself is a hinge joint, just like your elbows, that hinge joint doesn't really do a lot of side-to-side -side lateral movement, but it does do flexion and extension very very well. Remember the quadriceps are extension, hamstrings are flexion. Here's an anterior view of the knee itself with all those ligaments and tendons overlapping that knee joints. And when you talk about stability, a lot of it's coming from the muscles. All right, and if we're looking at the three different articulations, just like three in the elbow, then power three, three in the knee as well, we have the femoral or femoral tibial, medial and lateral. That's going on. We'll label this number one, this number two, one and two. And then we also have the femoral patellar or patellar femoral as in between the femur and the patella. Now the knee itself, like you can see in this video, can provide a lot of strength and a lot of power going through the knee itself, but it does only do flexion and extension, a little bit of rotation, 
but really that's coming more so from the hip and there's lots of ligaments to talk about in the knee many of which you might have heard about from injuries such as an ACL reconstruction surgery. As a reminder, at the knee, we can have many different positions, normal, varus, and valgus. Here's some pictures of varus. As you can see, there's a lot of space in between the legs right here versus a valgus where the knees are knock kneed and they come together. Now someone might have this genetically to where their bone structure sets them up in this way or they could have muscle weaknesses that produce these positions. So if you have a weak hip muscles it might allow your knees to collapse inward and they call that a valgus collapse, it can be fixed, and we'll talk about how today. External and internal joint capsule as it surrounds the knee. Again, a lot of hyaline cartilage in there and the knee joint, as well as a synovial membrane, giving it a little bit of cushion for the knee. You got a lot of weight coming down from the hips, but you also have a lot of force coming up from the tibia, so very important joint going on right here. All right, let's get kicked off with those ligaments. And we already mentioned this one in the last PowerPoint, but it's the patellar ligament. So coming down from the patella down to the tibia, and this specific spot is called the tibial tuberosity. You definitely want to know the tibial tuberosity as it relates to this bony landmark where the patellar ligament attaches. Now, if you've heard of patellar tendonitis, if you've heard of patella femoral pain, it is most often occurring right here in the center of the circle with star. That's where it is occurring within the patellar ligament. And we know the quadriceps can produce a ton of force. So imagine the force that's being pulled on this ligament when you contract your quadriceps, it takes a lot of force going through it. But that's only one ligament. Let's talk about the collateral ligaments. Co-lateral, lateral, on the sides. These are on the sides of the knee. And we've got one that's called the fibular collateral ligament, aka the LCL. But we got an LCL in the elbow, right? So make sure you're talking about the knee or you mention you're in the knee the tibial collateral ligament, also called the MCL. So LCL, MCL. So let's take a look at these on the knee. We can see the MCL on the tibial side. Again, it's tibial collateral ligament. Got to be able to write these out entirely. Plus you've got the LCL on the fibular side, the fibula side. So always look for that fibula bone as a way to tell what's lateral versus medial. Now these are strong, so these are going to prevent that lateral movement of the knee and keep it in line with the femur. All right, we just talked medial and lateral. Let's talk posterior and anterior. Let's start posterior here. There's actually a lot of support posterior because anterior, what you have a you have a bone, right? You have the patella. You have a lot of things stopping the knee from going too far anterior. But posterior, if you feel the back of your knee, go ahead and do that right now. Feel in between the hamstring tendons and the gastrocnemius, the calf. You'll feel just a soft, cushiony back of the knee popliteal region, right? Uh, it's got a ligament called the oblique popliteal ligament going obliquely across the backside. Basically, just giving it support giving it some protection so it doesn't extend too far. But let's get to the big ones here. Let's get to the cruciate ligaments. Cruciate means inside, deep within the knee itself. And we've got the ACL and the PCL, anterior cruciate ligament and the posterior cruciate ligament. So I've labeled those right here for you. And what you'll notice is they're named after where they attach onto the tibia. 
So the tibia, if it has an anterior attachment, that's the ACL. We can see this outlined right here. The PCL is just the opposite. It's got an attachment posteriorly on the tibia, which makes it the PCL. Now you tell me, just by looking at my outlines, which one is thicker? Take three seconds, should be an easy look here. Which one's thicker? Hopefully you said PCL. PCL is thicker, it's stronger than the ACL. The ACL gets torn much more often. Now the way the cruciate ligaments are set up, it's just like they're winding, almost like that towel that we twisted from the hip at the knee, they're winding. And when you immediately rotate your tibia, which is really hard to do, if not impossible to do with muscles. But if you were to do that, it'd be about 10% rotation, or rather 10 degrees of the tibia. But lateral rotation, that unwinds these ligaments in here. It unwinds it. So you can get 60, sometimes up to 90%, uh, sorry, 90 degrees. Come on, Professor Klein, 90 degrees of lateral rotation, especially when the knee is flexed. A lot more lateral rotation than medial rotation with the tibia. Let's zoom in to the ACL. Again, it's the weaker of the two cruciate ligaments, but it's still very, very strong. Uh, you gotta know though what it prevents. You know, what does a ligament do? Well, it stops two bones from going in a certain direction. And in this case, the ACL is going to prevent the anterior displacement of the tibia, which is a more common way of saying it, or the posterior displacement of the tip or of the femur. So posterior displacement of the femur or anterior displacement of the tibia is what it will prevent. All right, what does that mean? Anterior displacement of the tibia, posterior displacement of the femur. Here I've got a model. If you look into the middle, uh, this would be an anterior view, lateral view right now of the knee. I'm gonna pull it up. That's the ACL. See how it's attached anteriorly to the tibia? That's how you know it's the ACL. It's a rubber band in this model. But if I were to pull the tibia anteriorly, see how the ACL stretches and resists that movement? Or if I take the femur and I pull it posteriorly, it resists that movement. So whether you're doing one or the other or both, that ACL is gonna prevent it. If I go the opposite direction, doesn't really do any resisting. It's the two that we had mentioned. Now the way that you test this is with an anterior drawer test, which is essentially doing what I just did, pulling the tibia anteriorly, sometimes referred to as a Lachman's test to prevent that. We'll see those tests in a moment. Here's a couple actual human femurs and torn ACLs. Again, if you've ever torn your ACL, you know it's pretty painful sometimes and definitely requires reconstructive surgery to go in and give you a new ACL. Otherwise, the knee is going to be all over the place. Well, let's hit up the PCL. And again, the PCL is stronger, super strong PCL because it's thicker. So back there, it's going to limit a couple different things. First, it's gonna limit the anterior rolling of the femur during extension, aka you, you're gonna not extend or not be able to extend your knee as much so it doesn't excessively extend is kind of the way of saying that. And then it's going to prevent the anterior displacement of the femur and the posterior displacement of the tibia. That's the opposite of the, of the ACL for those motions. All right, we're back here with the knee joint, but now I've got a blue rubber band on. You can see that, let's take it down here. That's a blue one, that's a PCL. It's attached posteriorly to the tibia, and if I were to posteriorly displace the tibia, it's gonna stretch and limit that movement or anteriorly displace the femur. 
So you can definitely tear this, especially in sports. But here's where we connect the valgus and the varus and these ligaments. So as you'll notice, a lot of knee ligaments occur with the valgus knee position. So that knee buckling inward. Even the sport like track and field can have contact, especially in big races. But here we see the knee going inward, right, like that. That's going to put a lot of stress on the MCL. So valgus, I want you to think valgus, knee position, puts a ton of stress on the MCL. That's like in this position here where you can see the knee would be going inward if this is medial over here and really stretching that MCL. And as you can see here, it's torn as well as a little bit of the ACL. So that's why you can tear the ACL in a valgus position, but especially that MCL ligament, it will stress. Throw in the medial meniscus with meniscus are the different types of pads, connective tissue pads in between the joint. And those three things right down here, one, two, three, would be the unhappy triad. They call it the unhappy triad. If you tear all three, that's very common to occur. So let's test or talk about the tests for these real quick. I'd mentioned earlier the anterior drawer test in the Lachman stress. When I say anterior drawer, I kind of mean like this video down here where the cat pulls out the drawer. I love cats. The cat pulls out the drawer. Uh, that'd be like the anterior drawer test where the professional is pulling anteriorly on the tibia and holding or pushing down on the femur. Now, Remember back to what I just did with the knee, and you tell me, when you do that, what are you testing? Which ligament, rather, are you testing? And if you said, well, those ligaments, or that, those motions would test the ACL, you'd be correct, because if the patient does has a torn ACL, you will feel excess movement with this test. Let's take a look. All right, let's see a positive ACL test, which means it's been torn. It's positive, not really a positive thing in this case, but let's watch how this is performed. Have a relax and you just draw to be a forward towards you. So notice what he's doing. He is stabilizing the femur. He might just hold it or actually push down a little bit. And then he is pulling up on the tibia just like this. And watch right at the knee joint the movement that occurs. It's almost this kind of an angle. So your hand draw to be a forward towards you. It's almost this kind of an angle. That's excess movement of the tibia, thus torn ACL. And I do want to know anterior drawer test is actually when the knee is at 90. Otherwise, the Lachman's test is going to be 30 degrees of knee flexion for this test. Next up. The posterior drawer, the opposite, I like to partner these together because this is going to test for the PCL. Let's take a look at what this looks like. All right, so take a second to get oriented here. This is the knee. This is the leg down here. The doctor has a grip of the tibia and he's going to take it posteriorly back this way. So watch to see what happens. So a ton of movement here, a ton of movement going on at the knee, barely has to apply any pressure. As you can see, a positive 
right about here. That's a huge bit of movement of the tibia going posteriorly. So those were the ACL and the PCL test. Now we're going to talk about the MCL and the LCL test all the way back to the valgus and varus. So valgus, varus, two words you see over and over and over again. To test these ligaments, we said, well, the valgus knee position would test the MCL, right, down here. And the varus would test the LCL. Now, if you have functioning MCLs and LCLs, you really shouldn't feel a lot of movement in that direction, right? But if they've been torn, then you'll have a lot of excess movement, positive tests. Let's take a look. All right, so here we are looking at the knee. The doctor is going to push in above the knee on the femur and pull out on the leg or down at the ankle. That's going to stress this MCL right here. So let's watch and see what happens. So a good bit of movement. This is normal right here. And we stop it right there. That is, that's not super excessive, but notice the bend in the knee. And I bet you the doctor says he doesn't even have to pull that hard to get it to do that movement. That's positive valgus test. All right, and maybe my favorite of all the tests here, the varus test is a very pronounced positive varus. Let's take a watch. Do it. All right, he just kind of keeps it going and keeps it going. I'll stop it though, because as we can see here, the knee is extremely bent. Testing for that LCL, torn LCL in this case, and got to get that back to a straight line. So those are the four tests. Those are four awesome tests that you'll probably do clinically if you're an athletic trainer, if you're a doctor, a physical therapist, uh, to test those ligaments or even in the ER if somebody comes in for that. So let's do this. Let's take a short break. Take a break with me here. Uh, go for a walk, get some food, get some water, something like that. But while you're doing that in the break, try to list the four main ligaments of the knee and the four tests for it. I'll challenge you even to go beyond that. And if you have a partner or a, a classmate or somebody or anybody that you can perform these tests on, give it a try. Be gentle, but perform these tests to test their knee ligaments. All right, welcome back from your break there. Hopefully you got a good break and good assessment. I was just watching the moon. Such a beautiful moon out tonight. Uh, but we are ready to move on to the next portion. And we're talking about menisci. Meniscus is singular, menisci, plural. And these are the different connective tissue pads that go in between the tibia and actually sit right on top of the tibia and the femur. So we know in between joints, there's a lot of hyaline cartilage, but these are made out of fibrocartilage. So a little bit extra cushion on the knee, right? A little bit extra cushion on the knee for shock absorption. If we think about it, you got forces coming up from your foot. You got forces coming down from your hip. This is a very centralized portion of where the force is going to go. And if it's not stable, then there's going to be some issues. 
take a minute to notice the ACL coming off the anterior and the PCL right here, as well as tibial collateral ligament. Would that be medial or lateral? Well, hopefully you said real quickly medial because we got lateral collateral ligament over here with the fibular head. As always, with a joint like this, with a lot of different tendons, there's a ton of bursa, actually 12 different ones. So 12 is a high number, maybe even the record here because you've got so many tendons crossing over. You gotta have a bursa in the back, a bursa in the front, a bursa behind the kneecap, the patella there to cushion it. Otherwise you got bone to bone and you don't want that friction occurring. So lots of bursa to allow uh, the skin to move, a lot of the tendons to move, and just everything to move properly. All right, as we get down to the actual leg itself, we've got the tibiofibular joint here, the tibiofibular joint in between the tibia and the fibula. We've got a superior one up top. You also have a, an inferior one down here as well. Uh, they call that more the tibiofibular syndesmosis or syndesmosis uh, joint, tough one to say there, but that's the joint going on down there. There's a membrane in between called the inner osseous membrane. So that membrane is holding, in a way, the tibia and fibula together. So let's start adding in some muscles here, and you can start to see the different compartments of the leg. We've got the posterior compartment, we've got the lateral compartment, the anterior compartment. Guess what? No medial compartment on the lower leg. On the thigh, there was no lateral compartment. On the leg, there's no medial compartment. It switched sides, which is a good counterbalance. But remember the nerves that we've got right here, traveling down, main one is tibial, coming down the back, common fibular splits into the anterior and posterior fibular, and then tibial splits into the medial and lateral plantar. Take a minute to review those because those are very important in the leg. Here are those different compartments. I just named three of them, but we'll actually break the posterior into two, superficial posterior and deep posterior. Say it with me, deep posterior is one that we'll look at separate from the superficial calf muscles. And again, notice the medial side, there's nothing but bone. So feel, go ahead and feel your shin bone on the medial side. And when you feel that shin bone on the medial side, you feel the tibia, that's your tibia. So your shin bone is your tibia. You can't really feel your fibula though, right? Your fibula is covered with muscle over here. All right, let's look at some of these here. And the first is the anterior compartment. We've got a few large ones and we'll talk about a few that go all the way to the toes themselves. First one, one of my favorites, tibialis anterior. This one will tell you that it's attached anteriorly on the tibia. So the tibialis anterior will kind of highlight it and it goes all the way down to that first metatarsal. Tarsals in the feet carpals in the hands. And I won't go through all the specifics because we've got feature slides that run through the tables, but something like the extensor digitorum longus, it's going to extend the digits and it's a long muscle. Extensor hallucis longus, same thing. Hallucis or hallux is the big toe. Digit number one, similar to the thumb, that's gonna extend the big toe. There's a few other ones we'll talk about as we go through as well. For this one, I just kind of group all the tables together. So you'll notice these are the flexor hallucis longus, flexor digitorum longus, just like the extensors, but on the flexor side, I'm more focused with the nerve and the action. So just like the forearm, we didn't really focus on insertion or origin that much, but we did focus on the action and the nerve, so definitely know the action and the nerve. So something like the tibialis anterior is going to do ankle dorsiflexion. You gotta have the dorsi before the flexion because it's dorsiflexion and deep fibular 
nerve. So do that with me. It's that dorsiflexion movement, toes to the ceiling or toes to your shin is dorsiflexion. Opposite of dorsiflexion is plantar flexion. So this one plantar flexes the ankle right here for the soleus and the gastrocnemius. This is a superficial posterior compartment of your leg. Notice one thing though. Notice that the gastrocnemius also flexes the knee. Also flexes the knee because guess what? It originates above the knee on the femur. And because it crosses the knee joint, it's got an action on the knee joint. I will say with these two, you want to know the common insertion point of the calcaneus via the calcaneal tendon. What's the calcaneal tendon? It's the Achilles. So definitely know the insertion for the soleus and the gastrocnemius. These are bigger muscles, so it'll make sense when we look at them in a moment. Laterally, we've got two main muscles. They're called the same thing, except one's a brevis, one's a longus. Just talking about the size. You might see it as fibularis, but at least in the running world, oftentimes they call it peroneal. So in the anatomical world, I see it more as fibularis. In the, per, or in the running and sometimes athletic world, I see it more as peroneal. So just be aware that there are two for this. Now anything lateral is going to be the superficial fibular nerve. And anything lateral will evert the foot. Evert the foot is the main action of the lateral compartment of the lower leg. All right, now don't get the arteries and the veins mixed up with the nerves. The nerve is the common fibular coming down here and then it becomes superficial and deep fibular. But the artery itself coming down, popliteal, wraps around and becomes anterior tibial. There's also a posterior tibial as well. And then that becomes a dorsal pedis, dorsal pedis top of the foot for that. So imagine this artery coming down, coming down, and then supplying the top of the foot. A very important pulse is often taken on the dorsal pedis artery of the foot. All right, back to the superficial posterior compartment. I'd shown the tables for these, but now we can look at the two main ones, gastrocnemius over here. Let's label it number one. It's got two different heads to it. And the soleus over here, the soleus is deeper. Now there's also one called the plantaris, but it really doesn't do much. So you can actually use the plantaris for Tommy John surgery and some other surgeries as well. These are the tibial artery and vein coming down the back side, but you might also see sural nerve that is pretty much the same as tibial for that. Well, almost the same in the sense that sural is more superficial. Be running down on top of the gastrocnemius. Let's make this yellow here. But the deeper one would be the tibial. So most often tibial is okay to say for anything in the superficial posterior compartment or the deep. Here are two examples of how to strengthen the calf muscles. In our small professional teams, we'll talk about what the difference would be with a straight leg versus a bent leg. So straight leg versus bent knee. So straight knee versus bent knee. How that works, the gastrocnemius and the soleus differently. But they're both plantar flexion. And I've paused it here to so you can see plantar flexion going on in the one side as well as the beginning of plantar flexion. Let me, let me just make this. So now you can see them both in plantar flexion coming down and the toes are being pointed outward as well. Some of the anatomical differences of the gastrocnemius versus the soleus. They say stroll with your soleus, win the long jump with your gastrocnemius. Doesn't really rhyme, but 
stroll with your soleus means that the soleus is more for endurance. It's got more type one muscle fibers, which we know give you energy over a long period of time. But the type two fibers are more your gastrocnemius. So an event like the high jump or the long jump or any sort of explosive jumping is gonna be the gastrocnemius. Slower running, walking is gonna be the soleus. Here's some cadaver pictures of these things here. Again, the gastrocnemius is letter G right here. It's the one that you really see when you see someone's calf muscle. So it's the most superficial muscle on the back of the knee. Soleus again, stroll with the soleus. It's also gonna plantar flex. And again, it also inserts into the calcaneal or Achilles tendon but its attachment or origin is inferior to the knee joint. So I've got the triple jump here, as well as the vertical jump, which is extremely popular in the football combine. Let's take a look at these individuals using their gastrocnemius for these explosive activities. All right, here's the triple jump to get us started. If you're not familiar with the triple jump, they have to jump off one leg, let's say your right leg, float in the air, land on the same leg, and then they can hop to the other leg and then into the sand pit. So let's watch a little bit of this. It's over 18 meters, 18 meters. Watch the push off, the plantar flexion, extreme plantar flexion. Here we can see it. Gastrocnemius, watch the back of the calf. Let's get a side view. Wow, that's, that's a lot of plantar flexion right when they hit the ground to explode off and to go hit those 18 meters or more in distance. All right, so the link in your PowerPoint actually does not work anymore, but if you just Google uh, Josh's name here, sorry, I can't pronounce the last name, but if you Google that or YouTube it, you'll find this video, and this is the slow-mo video of him jumping. Watch how he uses the glutes, uses the, uh, quadriceps as well as especially the gastrocnemius in this jump. This is crazy to me, man. This just defies gravity on so many levels. And look at that. It's like some a ghost or something that's holding them up in the air, man. I just don't understand. So some funny commentary in there if you watch the video, but that's explosiveness. That's mainly coming from the gastrocnemius. So if you wanna be able to dunk a basketball or jump really high, you gotta focus on that gastrocnemius, especially for that. Now let's look at some of the deep posterior compartment muscles. We've got three main ones here. We've got tibialis posterior, flexor digitorum longus, flexor hallucis longus, and then we'll throw a popliteus in there as well, but these are the main three with the artery, the vein, and the tibial nerve, because again, we're deep posterior, so it's gotta be the tibial nerve. Take a look here though, they kind of intertwine themselves. For example, this is the flexor digitorum, it's gonna flex the toes, as you can see it going out to the toes, but something like the flexor hallucis longus, wraps down around and then to the first digit, the first digit there. Don't forget about the tibialis posterior, very similar to the tibialis anterior, but this one's 
going deep and then it stops right over in the uh, the medial side of the tarsals. All right, so just like the forearm, you wanna focus on action and nerve innervation, not so much origin and insertion, unless there's a specific one mentioned in this video or a common origin and insertion. Here are the muscle tables for you. So let me point out some of those specific origins and insertions. Uh, looking at something like the navicular or the tibialis posterior, that's important because the main function of the tibialis anterior or posterior as well as anterior will be inversion of the foot and supporting the medial longitudinal arch. We'll talk later about what that means, but basically that muscle is pulling up on the medial arch and inverting the foot. So imagine a flat foot on the medial side and then forming a little bit of an arch that's what's going on with the tibialis posterior. And because it's posterior, it's the tibial nerve right there. But if we're going to the other ones, we're talking deep fibular. So this is anterior now, so be careful. This is posterior. These are anterior. Uh, kind of sort those out as needed. But you can see the difference between tibial and deep fibular nerve. Quick assessment for you, looking at an x-ray video right here, you can see it is doing two different actions. Tell me what these two actions are. Take five seconds. Hopefully you think of them right away. But what are these two actions occurring at the ankle joint? All right, if you said ankle dorsiflexion and ankle plantar flexion, you would be correct. Let me just pause the video on this would be dorsiflexion here coming down the tibia what's the bone right underneath the tibia i'll outline it for you here hopefully you're thinking the talus bone talus bone would be correct how about back here the heel bone take a second what's the heel bone called that's the calcaneus for the heel, definitely calcaneus for the heel. And over here, how about this one? So we've got the navicular in there. Again, haven't done the foot PowerPoint yet, but you should start to get familiar with some of these bones. But back to the motions, if we're doing dorsiflexion here, mainly it's that tibialis anterior coming down originating on the first metatarsal, first metatarsal, uh, but as well as the dorsi, or sorry, the extensor digitorum longus, extensor hallucis longus, all the other ones that are extensors that would extend the toes also do some dorsi flexion. But now we gotta talk about plantar flexion. So if I play the video and then pause it, Right there, you can see door, or plantar flexion going on all about the posterior compartment, gastrocnemius, soleus, both inserting right there on the calcaneus via strongest tendon in the body, the calcaneal tendon or the Achilles tendon. So in addition to those big ones, you're going to have your flexor digitorum <laughs> longus, your flexor Holocus longus doing a little bit of the plantar flexion as well as the tibialis posterior but again main two ones are the gastrocnemius and the soleus so sample question is if a patient cannot plantar flex their ankle what nerve might be damaged so if a patient cannot plantar flex their ankle what nerve might be damaged Hopefully you're thinking tibial, 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 posterior chamber compartment is tibial. So let's zoom in down on the ankle. Let's start to add some retinaculums in and some other tendons because just like the wrist, the muscles are up in the forearm, but the tendons travel through the wrist. And in this case, they travel down and around the ankle. Specifically, we're looking at the medial 
malleolus, so medial malleolus right here. Feel that inside bump on the inside of your ankle. That's a big bump. You can also feel one laterally, the lateral malleolus. Those are the two bumps of the fibula and the tibia at the ankle. Now notice we've got five different things traveling medially and posteriorly to the medial malleolus. We have the posterior tibial artery, tibial nerve, calcaneal tendon way back there, so not on the list. But then we've got the tibialis posterior, flexus digitorum longus, flexus hallucis longus right there. They mentioned the anterior one because it's coming across again to that medial side to dorsiflex for the tibialis anterior. All right, so here's a way to remember these tendons because I will show a picture like this and label one and have you uh, tell me what it is. We, uh, the mnemonic we use is Tom, Dick, and Harry as you go from, from an anterior to a posterior direction. Got them drawn on here now for you. And basically what this says is Tom, T, this is talking about the tibialis posterior, number three. And that's the first one we can see, tibialis posterior. Dick, D, talking about the flexor digitorum, D digitorum, number four, right here. But then you'll notice before number five, right at the ankle, we've got the artery, that's the A and and, the nerve, that's the N and nerve and in and 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 then finally number five flexor halicus longus that's the hairy part of it that is number five i'll label it back here as well so be ready for something like that because this area is common for inflammation well, anytime you have those tendons kind of running next to bone it's likely to have some inflammation occur around the medial malleolus. But also notice how, let's say something like the flexor digitorum longus travels down all the way underneath the foot and then stretches out to all the foot muscles right there. Flexor halicus longus coming down, ducking underneath it, going to just the big toe way out here. Tibialis anterior stopping here. So just like the hand, you've got multiple different links of these tendons. Here's a cadaver picture just showing some of these tendons. Check them out on your own feet. You can definitely see when you dorsiflex, hopefully the tibialis anterior pop out of the front. You'll be able to feel the calf muscles, but also feel laterally for those fibularis longus and brevis muscles. Because that's what we're looking at next, the fibularis or peroneus longus and brevis. These are coming at us from the lateral side, so this is the head of the fibula coming down. And if we said two muscles invert the foot, what two muscles invert the foot? Take five seconds, you tell me what two muscles invert the foot. So if you said the tibialis anterior is one of them, you'd be correct, and the tibialis posterior is one of them, you'd be correct for inversion, that's supporting the medial, arch but when we're talking eversion and the lateral slash transverse arches it's all about the fibularis brevis and longus eversion so from a lateral view we can see those two tendons come down really they're very very similar all the way down the lateral malleolus right here wrapping underneath some retinaculum the only main difference is the brevis stops at the fifth metatarsal, the base of the fifth metatarsal, but the other one, the longest runs underneath all the way over to the first and second metatarsal. So longest, longer, brevis, shorter. And there we've got the retinaculum, which again, it's just like this thin piece of connective tissue, like your flexor retinaculum, your extensor retinaculum of your wrist, same thing going on in the ankle, it's holding the tendons closer to the ankle and the foot. Super important for keeping the movement going. Okay, so now that we've got a full scope of the muscles at the thigh, the knee, and the leg, 
and how they all interact. Now let's talk about some of these comprehensive issues. Back to that unhappy triad, which be able to list this out. One, two, three things that make up the unhappy triad, typically with a valgus, excessive valgus knee position, tearing those three things. And this just explains it a little bit more. If you're into injury prevention, which, which I definitely am, you want to know what positions the body should be in and then avoid the positions that it shouldn't be in. So when the foot is fixed, meaning just standing on the ground, and force is applied, you're landing, and the MCL and the LCL are taut, which means your leg is fully extended. Remember how I said you kind of want to have a little bend in your knee? That's good for taking on force. But let's say the leg is fully extended, and then you get some twisting going on, and you get that valgus position. Someone hits that person from the outside of the knee, and they push it on inward. That's so common in soccer. That's so common in football, hockey, whatever you might think of sports, as well as just somebody falling or falling off a trampoline or a pool or something like that is when it can occur as well. So let's keep looking at this because we've talked about valgus and varus and how, okay, anatomically, genetically, someone can have more valgus or varus, but then you can also see that in weaknesses of the body with that Q angle. Again, remember what that Q angle is. So here we have a study back in 2005 talking about sports-related knee injuries in female athletes. And Dugan basically said, what gives with why do female athletes have more ACL injuries? And what was found was essentially different things that ACL injuries are impacted by. And I'll let you read through these things. You definitely want to have a good understanding of the abstract that I've posted on Blackboard of why this might occur. So keep that in mind as we break down these last few slides. And as we can see with the patella, the patella is actually gonna aid us in producing force at the knee. So if we didn't have the patella and that extra leverage, the knee would not be able to function as it functions. So the patella is very important for the knee itself. But like I mentioned before, oftentimes you get a patellar femoral pain syndrome with chronic overload, just putting excess pressure on the knee, on the knee, on the knee. Be able to take pressure off the knee if needed, unless they put it on the hips or the feet or another area to relieve that pressure. Now, another reason we can think about for ACL injuries or any knee ligament injuries are the muscles that cross that area. Now, if the muscles are fatiguing or they're not working properly during especially deceleration or landing, then it's gonna put a lot of pressure on the knee. So let's say things like the quadriceps and the hamstrings and the gastrocnemius and the, the hip muscles, if they don't know how to eccentrically contract and slow your body down, it's gonna put a lot of force through that knee. So imagine landing softly is what they say and kind of slowly lowering your body. And then imagine just hitting the ground and not landing softly for that. So a few more different risks in here as far as different hormones might play a role, uh, anatomical considerations, larger Q angles with the normally wider hips, a neuromuscular imbalances, many, many different things that they've kind of listed here as reasons that we see higher rates of ACL injuries in females. Uh, this goes on to talk a little bit more about it. I don't expect you to look into all of these things, but you do want to know a general list of some of these things because you would want to design your strength and conditioning program differently if you had a population of women versus men or people even that are at risk. So noticing some of the valgus collapse, noticing some other things that could produce a higher risk of knee injuries.
but like we said, this study just generally found females need more strength in the quads and the hamstrings on average to balance the anterior and posterior chambers as well as the gastrocnemius for the knee stabilization. So some recommend recommendations for training is a lot of quadriceps strength with the eccentric contractions partnered with some hamstring strength training as well. So after, let's say they do have an injury, afterwards you still wanna train those muscles to prevent it from occurring again, a lot of jump training, just like they would experience in a game or a competition. On to some more recommendations for training, especially at the knees, because one of the most commonly injured areas is the knees. As mentioned before, the straight leg or even the excessive extension of the knee, not good. You want to have a little bit of flex in the knee as you're going through your training. Uh, if we think of it as like this up here, this hyperextended knee, and this is a very excessive case, should be more like that. So you want a little bit of a bend in the knee. As you can see over here, this is much, much better to have the bend rather than straight down. And it relates back to the hips as well. So if you forwardly rotate that pelvis or you posteriorly rotate or maybe shift it forward, that's going to change the pressure on your knees. Here we can see that valgus collapse right here with landing. And the correction would be again gluteus medius the abductors, the gluteus maximus for stabilization of the hips to more of a straight position. Not totally straight, but uh, much, much better than that collapse coming inward. And you can see it over here. It's complementary with a hip drop. One type of bursitis I want to point out is a baker's cyst. This is behind the pes and serenus. Remember that one? The S G. T muscles, sartorius, gracilis, and semitendinosis, not membranosis, but tendinosis coming down here, which can develop a cyst behind that area. Shin splints. What are shin splints? Maybe you've had them in the past, and here we can talk about the anterior part of the tibia. Remember, feel that medial anterior part of the tibia. That's where most often shin splints occur. These are actually micro fractures in the bone, and some micro fractures are good if you rest and recover after, and then they build stronger. That's important for bone strength, but too much bone fractures or too much bone stress with not enough recovery means you can break it more and more and more, and then those become, they form together and can become a stress fracture. So if you have shin splints, it's a, not a normal thing. It's not something to push through. You can definitely uh, change your form or even strengthen some muscles to prevent that. One of those muscles is the tibialis anterior that can assist in lowering your foot slowly to the ground to prevent from shin splints from occurring. Now let's talk about a few nerve issues here with the common fibular nerve issue. If that occurs, the patient might have a foot drop. So think about the common fibular going to the anterior and lateral compartments with the deep and superficial. So they cannot dorsiflex, they cannot evert. So their foot just drops in the plantar flexion and sometimes it slaps against the ground. Just kind of land, slap, land, slap. And that's because the nerve has been damaged. But if we keep looking, we can see there's three different types of compensations for a foot drop. They might bring it to the side by shifting. They might swing it out. They might step on over. You want to look for these things and maybe start to do this if you are people watching or observing people walking in different forms. Calcaneal tendon can also have some major issues. Uh, I can have tendonitis, very common if you put a lot of stress on the gastrocnemia and the soleus. Some more of the springy type runners, the runners that look like they're kangaroos or they're just kind of hopping around or the sprinters as well. 
they put more stress on their gastrocnemius, soleus, and that calcaneal tendon. Now it can rupture. And when this ruptures, even though it's the strongest tendon in the body, it can tear and cause a lot of pain a year and you're back to it. There was a football player I knew once that had this happen. He was getting ready to push off the line and he did and he thought somebody had stepped on his heel. But when he looked back, there was nobody there and he had torn his calcaneal tendon. Keeping it going, deep fibular and tra trap neck. Uh, deep fibular, just talking about that lateral compartment, lateral compartment here. So really an inability to evert the foot, evert the foot. This can result in something called the ski boots to where it kind of looks like someone is walking in ski boots, not really having a lot of eversion or uh, lateral movements going on with the ankle. And bringing it all together essentially is compartment syndrome. Any one of the compartments can get too big and push out on the fascia and cause some really bad pain and issues. If there's no room for it to expand, it's going to do what we call external compartment syndrome and just push on the nerves and push on the tendons and push until you need to go in and, and do some release of those areas. So one of the main ways this happens is with strenuous exercise, but catching it early can really help. Uh, increased compartment pressure has pain. They might have numbness, weakness, re reduced blood flow, some real major issues for this area. Now, obviously stretching is the first start. You wanna see if the muscle is just tight, but when that doesn't work, then you gotta keep going and you might have to eventually go get tested for this compartment syndrome to see if it's something to have surgery on. Now, in addition to that, you can really train the muscles to handle more stress, thus reducing the load, as well as your form. So what they saw actually in the study down here is that a heel strike puts more pressure on the anterior part of the shin, whereas a forefoot strike put it more on the calf or the posterior. So we talked before about shin splints. We talked about stress fractures. We talked about many, many different things. And I really will go forward and say, it's not so much the heel strike, but if you are putting pressure on the anterior compartment too much and not enough on the posterior, then switching to forefoot might allow you to do that and put more force and stress and pressure on the posterior muscles, which would take pressure off the anterior bone.